Um, after doing the video for the new force, uh, keep in mind, I've been active in Ghana in the media space, not just in Ghana, but been active in the media space for some time, been traveling back and forth, been involved in charity work and humanitarian work in Ghana for some time. And after the video came out with me as the spokesperson for the new force, I got a call from immigration uh, to come to their headquarters um, for some questions. So I went willingly. Um, I went uh, when they invited me a couple days after I went. Uh, they started to ask me all kinds of questions about my resident permit, which keep in mind, I've been traveling with back and forth uh, for years. Uh, it's been recently extended by another immigration officer. It was obtained through an official immigration officer. And I never had any problems with it. So they started to question me about the permit. Um, they asked me about certain documents that I have never seen before. And they asked me questions about the new force. So um, I, I, was, I was very confused why I was there. And then eventually, after some hours of questioning, they told me I had to stay there overnight. So um, I stayed in the cell overnight at immigration. And the things that I've seen there were just, um, I don't have words for it. It was very shocking. There were so, so, so many people there. Um, I think more than 15 people from all different nationalities, Africans, Arabs, uh, Asian people. And it, it was shocking to see that some of them were already there for nine months without hearing, without lawyer, without anything, and in just inhumane circumstances. Keep in mind, it was men and women um, together in the same cell, um, you know, some of them, they, they didn't even have the chance to make a phone call. They were stuck there for months, nobody to call, no lawyer, no counsel, um, sharing mattresses with each other. Like it was just, it, it, it was, it was baffling the things that I've seen there. Um, then the, the next morning, um, I was being transferred to NIV. I didn't know where I was going. Um, they just took me out of the cell, um, then they transferred me somewhere. I didn't know where I was going, so I was just being pushed in a van, and they took me somewhere after I found out I was at NIV, um, and, and that is where they told me I'm under arrest. I still didn't know what exactly for at that moment because there were no official charges. Um, so, yeah, that's how it went. Mm. Now, let, let's get this appreciation because most of us got to know I mean, that you had been arrested and kept in jail for four days. We will come to that. But let people understand, because we have seen you in the media space. We have seen you appear on what they call a TV networks, uh, participating <laughs> conversations. We have seen you direct traffic, no, not direct traffic, but help people actually at the traffic sections. We have particularly yeah. seen you go to Mepet to go and do donation. How did a Belgian woman wake up one morning and decide that Ghana was where I wanted to go to do all of these things? Well, um, I actually didn't just wake up and go to Ghana one day. I represented my country for many years as an international beauty queen for Belgium. So Ghana was one of the places where I represented Belgium as Miss Belgium at that time. So that oh, okay. was in like 2017. Mm. That was the first time I went to Ghana and I just connected really well with the people. I had a great time. I was, you know, I, I, it, it was just great. It was a great experience. And I was like, you know what? I like Ghana, but I've always been involved in humanitarian work and charity work as an international beauty queen. That's one of the things that you have to involve yourself in, you know, human, having a heart for humanity is, you know, what, what you're supposed to stand for as well. Mm, okay, no, I mean, that, that puts it into proper perspective. For some of us who did not know why you, of all the countries available in the world, chose to come to Ghana to do this. So now let's talk about what is the biggest accusation that was leveled against you. Specifically, in court, <laughs> in court, you were charged with, in fact, accused of violating section 52 -1 I of the Immigration Act 2000, that's at 573, and they stated specifically obtaining for yourself a student permit 
by false declaration? Um, the charges were actually that I forged national intelligence. Is somebody really supposed to be kept at national intelligence if it's a problem with your permit? You know, I, I think it was very clear that it was about the new force, which was all also mentioned in the charges that I was there because they wanted to investigate my um, activities in relationship to the new force. So um, there, there was no evidence. There never was any evidence presented. Uh, they did a house search. They had access. They had my phone in their custody. Um, there was nothing to prove that I forged documents to obtain a permit. Um, I, I obtained the permit through an official immigration officer, as I mentioned before. And I, I don't want, I don't know too much about the whole legal aspect. I think that is something for my lawyer, Mr. Sosu, um, can answer those questions better. But there was never any evidence presented, and um, especially if you if you know that they dropped all charges eventually, then you know we can ask questions on how true the allegations are. Now, I, I, I get this consistently because the, the people will say, I mean, why would you be interested in forging and acquiring a resident permit by forgery means to stay in Ghana? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that is the accusation that you cannot be purporting to do good when all that you are doing is premise on a very uh, false and fictitious uh, entry. I understand what you're saying, but there was no evidence. So I pleaded not guilty. All charges were dropped. There was no evidence ever presented in court. So I think we can we can conclude that it just wasn't true, especially when they brought into my charges that it was about the new force. And if there really was something wrong with my permit, how was I able to travel all these years back and forth, going through immigration checkpoints, even extending my residence permit for the, for the second time by an official immigration officer. I don't, I mean, I'll leave that up to, to the people to decide, but I think um, everybody with, with common sense can see that it's, that it's a bigger picture here. Mm. Now, let me get this clear. Were you attempting to school or were you ever in school in any public university in Ghana? Um, I was still deciding on taking courses. I was still deciding, but I was told that um, with my resident permit, I also could go to school. So I just went through an official immigration officer. He told me to do ABC. I gave him my passport. I paid what I was supposed to pay, and I got a resident permit in, in you know, just to, to I could work with it, I could travel with it, I could go to school with it or do whatever I wanted in the country. So I never forged any documents. I never had to do any such thing to obtain a resident permit. Somebody who's been traveling to so many countries, like, uh, why would I forge documents to obtain a resident permit? That doesn't make sense. The other question, though, is why would you really want a resident permit in Ghana? Why not? I've been staying there for, for some few years and I, I was based most of my time in Ghana. I was involved in a lot of humanitarian work, charity work, built a network there. Um, I was involved in media projects. I have a, a network of friends. Um, so why not? I mean, were you intending to stay permanently in Ghana? I was, st I was spending most of my time in Ghana because okay. I had... I some things going on and um, well maybe maybe one day I would I would naturalize or, or I, I don't know I leave that I leave that open but you know my love for Ghana I think uh, I think I've always shown a great love for the country and and you know I think I contributed to society in a very positive way um, throughout my time in Ghana. Now, what were the conditions like during your time in custody, and especially concerning the lack of, I mean, uh, when you, so you had mentioned you were transported. At what point were you officially given access to counsel or probably put before court? How many days were you in detention before you were officially uh, taken to court? Um, so after 48 hours, the 48 hour benchmark was approaching and I still didn't get to see my charges officially. 
So um, after 48 hours, uh, the people from immigration, they secretly took me away. My counsel was present at NIB at that time, but I didn't get the, the chance to have a confidential conversation with him because they always tried to deny me access to my counsel. I wasn't, I wasn't granted any phone calls. I was completely out of touch with everything and everybody. So when the 48 benchmark approached, uh, my lawyer was present at NIB. They took him into a room and they took me away. At that point, they pushed me in a van and they took, or, or, or in a car and they took me somewhere. I didn't know where I was going. So I kept asking, where am I going? What's going on? Where am I going? Why, why, why can I not speak to my lawyer? And um, I, I, nobody was telling me anything. And then I saw we arrived at court and I was like, my lawyer should be aware, like you should make him aware, or you should call him or let him know that I'm here, but they refused. They just ignored me, they, they weren't listening to me, they were lying to me that they were just going to file some documentation at court, and eventually they wanted to put me on the stand, take my plea, and you know, potentially let myself, let me incriminate myself. I had a counsel, I had a lawyer, and they refused to give me access to him. They refused to call him. They refused to let, let him know where I was at that point. So that was very um, inhumane. Um, so at that point, I, I uh, told the judge, I spoke up for myself. I had to speak up for myself, and I told the judge that I do have a counsel, and I want my lawyer to be present. Um, the judge was very disappointed in in. Uh, you know, the prosecution, and she told them uh, I, I needed to make a, like, if I want to make phone calls, they have to let me make phone calls, but they never even granted my phone calls until two days after, um, you know, and, and that means that I would have to come back the next day, so I would have to stay an other night in, in, in the cell. So that is already, uh, those are already a series of violations of human rights that they deny you access to your counsel, no official charges, uh, crossing the 48-hour benchmark, um, intentionally keeping me away in court from my lawyer, um, not granting me phone calls, it, it, like they try to do a search without, without a warrant, like all of these things are, are just straight-up violations. And what